Boxiana, or Sketches of Ancient and Modern Pugilism, by Pierce Egan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That the English nation has distinguished itself among the moderns as bestowing applause and substantial reward on every brave and noble exertion, I am proud to allow, and I will also concede that the present age surpasses those of former times, and the last hundred years as the great milling era of the world. But as a true admirer of the nations of antiquity, I should feel that I did not do justice to their character, did I not remark that the Greeks and Romans were equally assiduous in cultivating the powers of the human system, and no less famous for their admiration of feats of valor in the arena of the amphitheatre. To ascertain who was the first boxer is a question of more than ordinary difficulty in deciding with accuracy. Shakespeare makes the grave-digger in Hamlet tell us Adam was the first that bore arms, but that is not sufficiently to the purpose. Pollux, the twin brother of Castor, is the first, it appears, who made such proficiency in the science as to hand down his name to future ages. This was he whom Jupiter, in the form of a swan, is said to have begotten on the body of the fair Leda, the mother of the beauteous Helen. Such was the admiration in which he was held, that future ages ascribed to him immortality, as for the same reason they had done to Hercules, and assigned to him a seat on Olympus in the assembly of the gods. He is the father, and in pagan times he was deemed the god of all the boxers. Hac arte Pollux et vagus Hercules Inixus Arces Atigit Igneus. Horus. Pollux and wandering Hercules, by sparring, gained in heaven a place. Eryx, the Sicilian, a son of Venus, had used the Cestus with such success that he vanquished every opponent. At length, having challenged Hercules, he was killed by the latter in a desperate combat nor could Amisus find an equal, till Pollux, in a trial of skill with him, obtained the superiority over his prowess. But the best account of a battle with the ancient Cestus is given in Virgil, where, although the rounds are not described with the peculiar minute of a prize contest at Moolesley Hurst, the arena of modern exploits, yet enough is mentioned to give an adequate idea of the gluttony and bottom of Darius and Entellus, the latter of whom, in particular, after a tremendous flooring, when his friends and the spectators thought Entellus was decidedly finished, he, by a determined rally, gave his opponent so severe a milling that he was eventually declared the winner, while Darius, on the contrary, was carried from the scene of action with scarcely any life in him, and totally incapable of making use of his legs. There appears no regular data to determine the fact whether in the exercise of the Circus of Rome the pugilists ever fought with naked hands and arms, but as this nation, it seems, borrowed most of her arts from Greece, it is probable that the boxers never engaged without the chirothake, or gloves, stuffed with lead more especially as the ancients were remarkably fond of show in their public exhibitions of vigor and strength originally little doubt can exist when every man stood on the alert to provoke or resist an insult he fought without system and with naked fist but soon rules were laid down and these natural means of attack or defense submitted to peculiar regulations the collection of which became a discipline, a science, and an art. A discipline because it was taught for the benefits of the respective individuals. A science on account of the necessary trainings before the acquisition of expertness. And an art with respect to the different studies it presupposed. 
Consequently, in order to give a better opportunity to the boxers to show their skill by protracting the temporal length or duration of their exertions, strong armor for the head and hand was invented. This circumstance gave rise to two sorts of boxing. The first, when the champions had no other arms than their natural strength and agility, the other when they made use of the Amphotides and Cestus. The Amphotides, as the word implies, were a sort of guard to secure the temporal bones and arteries, and encompassing the ears in their thongs and ligaments, which used to buckle either under the chin or behind the head. They were not unlike caps made of hides of bulls, studded with knobs of iron, or strongly quilted, in order to blunt the impetus of the blows. But this mode of fighting seems rather to belong to the second age of the pugilistic era. The cestus was an offensive weapon, the headpiece a defensive dress. Several sorts of cestus, or gauntlets, were known to the ancients, and were composed in general of strong interwoven leather straps, which, embracing the fist and part of the carpus, or wrist, and winding up round the forearm, were fixed at the elbow. They appear to have often been armed with knobs of brass, blunt points of iron, plummets of lead, etc. The following lines from Dryden's Virgil, BVP 533, beautifully describe the cestus used by Eryx. He, Antellus, threw two ponderous gauntlets down in open view, gauntlets which Eryx wont in fight to wield, and sheath his hands within the listed field. With fear and wonder seized, the crowd beholds the gloves of death, with seven distinguished folds, of tough bull's hides, the space within is spread with iron, or with loads of heavy lead. Gary's himself was daunted at the sight, renounced his challenge, and refused to fight. Astonished at their weight, the hero stands, and poised the ponderous engines in his hands. The performers in the athletic art, it appears, were divided into three classes, the boxers, wrestlers, and runners. If we attend to the manner in which a man attacks his antagonist, we shall find that boxing comes in the first place, closing or wrestling in the second, and running, if fear makes its unwelcome appearance, in the third. Thus Homer considers it, and generally follows this order in his descriptions of gymnic games. Plutarch asserts that the pugilate was the most ancient of these games, and took generally the lead in all public spectacles, as the most manly and scientific of the gymnic arts. It also appears that pugilism, or pugilate, is derived from the Latin pugilatus, the art of fighting with the fist, pugnus. These words were evidently borrowed from the Greek pix, adverb, pugno vel pugnus, pigma hin, pugnus pugnare. It is not unworthy of observation that this thema seems originally to have signified anything in the shape of a round box, and consequently the human fist, which, when clenched, takes that form. As we may easily see by its derivative, pixis, a box, hence our expression of boxing, box being often used for a blow of the fist. A proof of this etymon, in the compound words pugnose, pug-dog, employed to indicate a knobby, fist-like shape in the most prominent part of the face, and the tree used for making boxes, claims the same origin for its name. Pixos, Buxus, Box. The Greeks, it seems, were the first people who cultivated the pugilate as a science, confined it to strict rules, and selected experienced masters and professors who, by public lessons, delivered gratis in palestri and gymnasia, erected for the purpose, instructed the youth in the theory and practice of the art. 
the kings and princes of this nation did not disdain to lay aside their dignity for a few hours, and, exchanging willingly the scepter for the cestus, seemed to be more proud of the vigor of their fists and muscular length of their limbs than of the strength of their armies and the extent of their dominions. In Greece, the science of boxing, like all the other liberal arts, was cultivated with much ardor. Once in three years, the whole nation, consisting of so many various states, assembled at the Isthmus of Corinth to celebrate the games in honor of Neptune. To this place resorted all that was enterprising in youth, great in manhood, or glorious in old age. The generous admiration of an applauding nation placed the crown upon the head of the successful pugilist, and at his return home he was received in triumph as the supporter of his country's fame. The pen of the poet sought renown in handing down to posterity, in musical numbers, the feats of heroic enterprise. Even the genius of Pindar found the way to reputation by celebrating the horses victorious in the chariot race. The first of these poets appeared in the train of heroism and sought immortality under the shade of the name of men whose hardihood had conducted them to glory. The inferior lot of the poet is described by the first of all the Latin lyric writers. Quem tu, melpomene semel, nascentum placido lumine videris, illum non labor isthmius chiarabit pugilem. Lib. 4, Ode 3. Which may be thus rendered, he at whose birth the muses did preside shall ne'er in victory's car as champion ride. The poets, however, may take comfort in the reflection that, next to the performing of great deeds ourselves, the most honorable part is to celebrate them in others. It is a glorious thing, says Cicero, to do well to the Republic, and also to speak well is not contemptible. In returning to the period of English history, when scientific boxing became a prominent national feature, it appears that nearly a century has elapsed since Fig first publicly exhibited himself as a pugilist by promulgating the art of self-defense. It was about the year 1720. The science of boxing might then be considered in its very dawn. The superior knowledge that he possessed of the sword and stick drew crowds after him when he professed to teach pugilism. Fig was a native of Tem, in Oxfordshire, dwelt in Mary Le Bon, and taught numbers of gentlemen scientifically at his amphitheater in Oxford Road, when his fame was so great that we find him praised in the Tatler, Guardian, and Craftsman by the several writers in those miscellanies. With the sword he was unrivaled. He was not so scientific as a pugilist, and contrasted with more modern times, he would rank with the old ruffian Simmons. Sutton, the pipe-maker of Gravesend, was his rival, and dared the mighty fig to the combat. Twice they fought with alternate advantage, but at the third trial a considerable time elapsed before victory decided for either party. In fine, neither Ned Sutton, Tim Buck, nor Bob Stokes could resist his skill and valor. He had never been defeated but once, and then by Sutton, in one of their previous combats, though it was generally allowed to have been owing to his illness at the time. Fig died in 1734. He had often exhibited before George the Second with great applause. Bill Flanders, a noted scholar of Fig's, fought at the amphitheater in 1723 with Chris Clarkson, denominated the Old Soldier. It was highly spoken of at that period. It was looked upon as a very great proof of self-denial in an amateur if he failed a meeting on those occasions. From Fig's theatre he will miss a night, though cocks and bulls and Irish women fight. But it is due to Broughton to observe that owing to his exertions he gave a refinement to the practice of boxing it did not possess before his period of teaching the art of self-defense. 
which not only rendered it familiar, but interesting to all ranks of the British nation. The Cestus, so much deprecated by the enlightened part of mankind, as forming a part of the gladiatorial system of the Romans, from its death-like qualities in the combat, which rendered their public displays so repulsive to the feelings of humanity, was, by the above gymnastic hero, completely avoided in his exhibitions, by the introduction of the harmless mufflers, as may be seen from the following advertisement in the Daily Advertiser of February 1st, 1747. N.B. Mr. Broughton proposes, with proper assistance, to open an academy at his house in the Haymarket, for the instruction of those who are willing to be initiated in the mystery of boxing, where the whole theory and practice of that truly British art, with all the various stops, blows, cross buttocks, and etc., incident to combatants, will be fully taught and explained, and that persons of quality and distinction may not be debarred from entering into a course of those lectures. They will be given with the utmost tenderness and regard to the delicacy of the frame and constitution of the pupil, for which reason mufflers are provided that will effectually secure them from the inconveniency of black eyes, broken jaws, and bloody noses. The above invitation had the desired effect, and Broughton's school was crowded with scholars of the first rank and character in the nation. Originally, Broughton was a waterman, but he afterwards became one of the yeomen of the guard. He accompanied to the continent the Duke of Cumberland, his patron and great admirer of pugilism, and upon being shown the fine regiment of grenadiers at Berlin, belonging to Frederick the Great, so distinguished for their martial appearance, rigid discipline, and great valor, was asked by the Duke what he thought of any of them for a set to, when Broughton, with a smile, instantly replied, Why, your royal highness, I should have no objection to fight the whole regiment. Only be kind enough to allow me a breakfast between each battle. This pugilistic veteran lived to the good old age of eighty-five years, and died on January 18, 1719, at Walcott Place, Lambeth, and was interred in the churchyard of that parish. It does not appear that either Tom Johnson or Big Ben, those warlike champions of the fist, were ever anxious to obtain an eminence as sparrers, but their exploits in the ring have given to those boxers characters so distinguished for manhood that while the annals of pugilism are preserved from the ravages of time, the names of Johnson and Brain will never sink into oblivion. As a teacher of the science, it was Mendoza that immediately trod in the steps of Broughton. He made the art of self-defense, when quite a boy, his peculiar study. His success as a professor was unrivaled, and there was scarcely a town of note in the kingdom in which Mendoza did not exhibit his finished talents as a pugilist with admiration. It seems he derived his primitive knowledge of boxing from the tuition of his elegant rival Humphreys, but he so rapidly improved upon the system of his master as to remain several years without a rival. No man united the theory of sparring with the practice of boxing to greater advantage than Dan Mendoza and though upwards of fifty years of age, he exhibits at the present day with attention and respect. The next in succession, among the highest circles of the patrons of the art of self-defense, stands Mr. Jackson. It is upwards of twenty years since he appeared in the ring with Mendoza. As a teacher of the science, in every point of view, Mr. Jackson is entitled to preeminence, and no man more deservedly. Independent of the conciliatory, prepossessing manners of a gentleman, and the advantages of fortune and superior company, his fine athletic frame, added to his indefatigable study and extensive practice, he has been enabled to acquire those requisites toward perfection 
that few, if any, pugilists in other situations of life could be expected to attain. His guard is altogether so firm and compact, his arm so powerful and irresistible, and his mode of instruction so explanatory and decisive, that it appears it is almost impossible to plant a blow upon any part of his person with anything like severity of effect. At his elegant rooms, 13 Bond Street, Mr. Jackson's lessons on the pugilistic art were long honored by the numerous attendants of nobility and gentry, among whom the names of many of the first characters in the nation might be seen in the subscription list. The rooms, during the season, are open three times a week, where everything respecting the prize ring and connected with pugilism are determined under the immediate auspices of Mr. Jackson. It is only at the above rooms that Mr. J. exhibits. He is pronounced by the scientific amateurs to have no superior in his knowledge and display of the art, scarcely an equal in setting to, and few, if any, disposed to dispute this superiority with him. It may not, in this place, be improper to remark that among the numerous species of amusements prepared to attract the attention of the royal heroes and their generals who visited the Prince Regent in England in 1814 in honor of the peace of Europe, it should seem none interested those great warriors more than the art of self-defense portrayed in an exhibition of sparring. Lord Lowther invited the Emperor of Russia, Generals Platoff and Blücher, to an elegant déjeuner, when the national sport of boxing, as a peculiar trait of the brave natives of England, was introduced for their approbation at his lordship's house in Pall Mall on Wednesday, June 15, 1814. Those distinguished visitors were so much gratified with this generous mode of settling quarrels and the scientific mode of attack and defense exhibited that they earnestly requested of Lord Lowther that another trial of skill might take place on the Friday following, when, in addition to the above visitors, the King of Prussia, the Prince Royal of Prussia, Princes Frederick and William of Prussia, the Prince of Mecklenburg, General York, etc., etc., honored the meeting with their presence. Some elegant specimens of the pugilistic art were displayed between Messrs. Jackson, Belcher, Cribb, Richmond, Painter, Oliver, etc. The set-twos in general were excellent, but the sparring of Jackson was particularly admired. The elegance of his positions, the celerity of his attack, the fortitude of his manner, and the superior mode he developed of guarding his frame from the attacks of his adversaries created a lively interest among the royal warriors. His symmetry of figure and fine muscular powers also did not pass unnoticed. The champion of England, Cribb, occasioned a general stare among the spectators, and the veteran Blucher eyed him with more than common attention. The royal guests expressed their satisfaction at the treat they had experienced, and upon taking their departure, complimented his lordship as the patron of so manly and characteristic a trait of his country. Since the popular fighting days of Mendoza, no pugilist, it is certain, has appeared in the prize ring in possession of science to realize an equality of milling fame with the above distinguished Israelite as Tom Belcher. The debut of the latter, with Jack War in 1804, exhibited such superior knowledge of boxing as to astonish the most competent amateur present of his decisive talents. And from that period, down to the present moment, he stands confessedly as the first public exhibitor of sparring on the list of scientific pugilists. It appears, since the Fives Court in St. Martin Street, Leicester Fields, has held its rank as a national and manly place of amusement among the numerous public exhibitions of the present enlightened era in the first metropolis in the world, scientific pugilism 
has made rapid strides towards perfection, and the art of boxing has not only been more extended, but its requisites, in consequence, become better known. The fives court holds out two particular advantages, namely, those pugilists who, from their good conduct, are entitled to the patronage of the amateurs, are permitted to take their benefits, and those persons, whether from want of inclination or inconvenience, who do not witness the combats of the ring, may, at the above place, see the science illustrated in every point of view with the gloves by the various boxers with all the minute of a regular match, and without offending the most fastidious advocates of humanity. Besides, it not only affords new candidates an opportunity of exhibiting their pretensions, but it also operates as a mode of public practice, and keeps the abilities of the professors continually before the eyes of their patrons. Improvement may be discovered, and condition is not overlooked. From such frequent opportunities as above stated, the wary better is enabled to form a tolerably correct judgment respecting new matches, and he does not attend a prize battle with a mind totally uninformed upon the subject. Viewed as an object of national amusement, it operates in another sort of way, that if the merits of the milling stage cannot boast so often of the advantages of criticism as the boards of more classic theatres, nor the qualities of the performers become so generally the theme of discussion as the extraordinary flights of genius elicited by a Kemble or a Keene, yet nevertheless the elegant attitudes and scientific traits of a Belcher, the manliness of a Crib, the unceasing activity of a Carter, and the getting-away system of a Richmond, are in their peculiar circles perhaps as much the objects of attraction and their various acquirements decanted upon with equally as much warmth and attention by the amateurs of this old English sport towards promoting the true spirit of the country as to raise its importance from subjects of a more refined source. The fives court is well attended during the season, and the exhibitors rather numerous, but the principal heroes who take the lead in point of excellence are Belcher, Eels, Richmond, Cribb, Carter, Randall, Head, etc. The admission by tickets is three shillings each person. It will hold upwards of one thousand spectators, and upon several patriotic occasions, such as in aid of the suffering Portuguese from the burning of their towns by the French, for the British prisoners in France, and for the widows and orphans of the brave fellows who fell at the Battle of Waterloo, some hundreds of pounds have been collected towards their relief. The audience generally are of the most respectable description, and many persons of the first rank are often witnessed among them. Respecting the utility of the above exhibitions, it has been observed, by a distinguished and experienced boxer, that to advance rules in a magisterial manner, and lay them down as infallible, would be truly absurd. Since the principles of almost every science have been found liable to change, it were presumptuous to pronounce ours free from the same imperfections. Sparring is absolutely necessary to form a complete pugilist. It is certainly a mock encounter, but at the same time a representation, and in most cases an exact one, of real fighting. It is the only proper introduction to boxing, and a just mode of realizing whatever principles the scholar may have imbibed, or trying the success of any new plan he may have invented. By this method, he can also judge of the propriety of his master's lessons, and exercise his reasoning faculties, an advantage of which he is often deprived in battle. Some are of the opinion that sparring is of no great use, and that it takes from the natural powers of manhood, while it only teaches finesse that cannot prove hurtful to a courageous adversary. This, however, is merely reviving an opinion maintained by the pupils of the old school, in which strength generally prevailed over skill. 
It is not evident that preparation is necessary for every exercise, but more particularly for that in which hostilities take place. And what is sparring but a preparation, and of the nearest affinity to boxing? The advocates for this opinion might, with equal propriety, assert that shooting at a mark was of no service in forming an expert gunner. It should be generally understood that the practice of sparring is recommended as if in real action. No maneuvers, no attitudes ought to be adopted unless experimentally, but what would be introduced in actual fight. For instance, let any one suppose a sparring room the scene of battle, and exert himself upon that principle, he will easily habituate himself to the exercise of all his powers, and act by the same rules in the hour of danger. There may be a great difference between sparring and fighting. One may be very courageous in play, whose heart would be intimidated in real action. But this want of valor is by no means an argument against the doctrine that is laid down here, since cowardice is not produced by sparring, for he must have been in the same degree dastardly if he had never seen it, and perhaps more so. What is mentioned here only goes to prove that where two persons possess equal courage, strength, and activity, the man who makes sparring his practice must be superior to him who does not as one who considers a thing before its performance must, unless chance interfere, have an advantage over him who thinks consideration unnecessary. Strength, science, courage, activity, the power of bearing blows, a quick eye, and good wind, are the constituents of a complete boxer. In describing the above requisites, to form a complete boxer, it is not insinuated that no person can be a good pugilist without them all. One man possesses more requisites than many others, and will be therefore superior. But he who unites all that is necessary in himself will be victorious, until his equal appears, whom a single requisite, possessed on either side in greater degree, will give the advantage. Activity or milling on the retreat, is, at the present period, a greater requisite toward victory than it was formerly considered. Some have censured shifting as an unmanly custom, but without reason. If, indeed, mere brutal force were to decide a combat, it might be deemed improper, but where the mind has considerable share in the decision, as the case at present, getting away cannot be thought unmanly. The same censure might be passed on fencing, or an accidental rencontre in the field of battle, but would it not be absurd to say to a man, whose only care is the preservation of his life, you must not avoid your enemy's sword by changing your ground, you must not make use of that activity of which you are capable, because it is unmanly. Richmond has, in all his battles, practically decided the advantages of milling on the retreat towards victory. The power of bearing blows, or what is generally called bottom, quickness of eye and wind, are requisites of great importance, and may be all improved by constant practice. There are men who seemed peculiarly formed for bottom. The severest blows make little impression on the ribs of some, and the heads of others. The old school furnishes a surprising instance of bottom. The noted buckhorse, it is said, made a practice of standing without a guard, and permitting himself to be knocked down by the hardest hitter for a trifling sum of money. The modern school also furnishes numerous instances of bottom exhibited by Cribb, Painter, Oliver, the unfortunate Curtis, etc. The advantage of a good eye is evident. It is necessary to discern the approach of a stroke, as well as to perceive the vulnerable parts of an opponent. A resolute look is useful in awing an opponent, and often disconcerts the boldest. 
the eye should never be closed in the time of action. Wind, though naturally good, may be improved by the exercise of sparring. The pupil's first object of knowledge should be to acquire a proper mode of striking. A decisive blow may be made by a person unacquainted with the other parts of pugilism, and though a man may be well versed in the guards, he hazards much in parrying his adversary, if he himself is ignorant of the principles of striking, because he knows not the common direction of the arms against which he is to defend himself. Thus, whether we consider striking in an offensive or defensive view, either to assault an adversary or receive his attack, it is the most elementary part of boxing, and should be the first studied. The large knuckles of the hand should be only used. They are rarely disabled, but the knuckles in the middle of the fingers frequently give way. Straight blows are preferable to all others. They are stronger because they come directly from the center of the power, and quicker because they describe less space in the attainment of the object. It therefore follows that it is more difficult to parry them than any others. Round hitting is now universally exploded. It is condemned by the same reasons which recommend straight blows, for it is directly contrary to them. In the zenith of Mendoza, it was the custom to extol chopping as the best mode of hitting. It is a blow struck on the face with the back of the hand. Mendoza claims the honor of its invention, but unjustly. He certainly revived and considerably improved it. It was practiced long before our time. Broughton occasionally used it, and Slack, it also appears, struck the chopper in giving the return in many of its battles. The advocates for chopping at the present period are very few, if any. Experience proves that it can be of no great service, since, of all the pitched battles which have been lately fought, it has not contributed to gain one. In the contest between Tyne and Crabbe, Chopping suffered a shameful disgrace. Crabbe was thought next to Mendoza, the most successful in the use of it, yet he never hit Tyne. Indeed, reason convinces us that it can be of no great utility. It partakes of the nature of a round blow, for it is given downwards or sideways, and must therefore deviate from the center. It also exposes the arm to danger. Every chopper should take its force from the play of the arm, between the elbow and wrist. But if, in the eagerness of action, the elbow should be thrown too forward, the small of the arm may be broken. Some pugilists are not for entirely laying it aside, and think it may be happily used in giving the return Considering, if a boxer engages with a person ignorant of the science, it will certainly prove successful. But when two skillful boxers meet, no reliance is to be placed upon it, and such is the opinion of the most experienced professors of the present day. A knowledge of the parts of the body most dangerous to be struck is necessary to every boxer, but first it should be observed that any blow planted on the waistband or below it is unfair, and causes the loss of the battle. Whatever rules are laid down in sparring should be followed in fighting. They are both considered in the same view, and what is mentioned concerning the one is applicable to the other. Every student should endeavor to unite grace with power, and this may be easily accomplished since nature delights in the graceful. To point out any attitude as the best in all cases would be ridiculous. A physician might as well prescribe one medicine for all constitutions. Everyone should adopt his mode of defense to his own powers, of which, after some practice, he must be the best judge. This only is necessary to remark when a person, after mature deliberation and some experience, has adopted a particular guard he should not easily relinquish it. His only plan should be its improvement, for if he continually seek for new positions, he cannot act by rule, and must often leave the decision of a combat to fortune. The triumph of Humphreys over Mendoza at Odiham 
is a strong proof of the propriety of this advice. Though the latter changed his manner of fighting as often as Proteus did shapes, yet he was as often vanquished. A systematic conduct will prevail over irregularity, which chance can only render victorious. Perhaps it may be necessary to notice, lest it should be adopted by others who might think it proper, merely from seeing it often used. The arms are crossed to form the guard. Two disadvantages result to any person who practices this. In the first instance, one of his adversary's hands, placed upon the upper arm, will force them both down and expose the superior part of the body. Secondly, a blow given by one in this position cannot be in a direct line and must therefore lose much of its force. Though we cannot be always guarded, particularly in attacking an enemy, yet we should, as much as possible, preserve our guard. Upon this principle, the arm should be drawn but very little back to strike, for the guard is lost in proportion to the retrograde motion. An adversary also gets notice of his danger, and is, of course, prepared to receive the assault. A blow should be struck, without any previous alteration of attitude, for even should it fail, the attempt is productive of little mischief, and leaves no opening, if the guard be immediately recovered. But this cannot be done when the weight and strength of the body are thrown in with the blow, a measure which never ought to take place, unless it is absolutely certain that an opponent cannot defend it. A skillful boxer will never hazard a blow without the prospect of putting in a second to more advantage. Feints, though extremely useful, and the effects of science, are not so much attended to as they merit. If, in fencing, they prove so decisive, why should they not be adopted with equal success in pugilism? It is urged by some that a boxer should always keep his arms in motion to and fro. The reason given in its defense that the action of the fists prevents the approach of a blow from being perceived, is perhaps not strictly just, for is not the violent increase of motion as easily discerned as its beginning? If this be true, it will follow that it is better to keep the arms steady, because motion will cause an antagonist to be more carefully on his guard, since he must every moment expect an assault, whereas their firmness may betray him into fancied security. Closing has been for some time exploded, and this alone may serve as an argument to show that boxing is greatly improved, since what was formerly of much utility is now esteemed unnecessary or of little value. Yet pugilists should familiarize themselves to closing, that whenever it occurs they ought to be prepared for the worst. In concluding this subject, it is thus Sir John Sinclair, in his Code of Health and Longevity, observes with respect to fencing, and which applies with equal force towards the improvement of the Constitution, as derived from the exercise of sparring, many instances of which the author of this work has been well assured of from the teachers of pugilism, that induced him to make the following extract. There is no exercise, says Sir John, with a view to health, better entitled to the attention of those who are placed among the higher classes of society than that of fencing. The positions of the body in fencing have for their objects erectness, firmness, and balance. And in practicing that art, the chest, the neck, and the shoulders are placed in positions the most beneficial to health. The various motions of the arms and limbs, whilst the body maintains its erect position, enables the muscles in general to acquire vigorous strength, and in young people the bones of the chest and thorax necessarily become more enlarged, by means of which a consumptive tendency may be prevented. Various instances may be adduced where fencing has prevented consumption and other disorders. It has been remarked also that those who practice this art are, in general, remarkable for a long life and the good health they have enjoyed. 
These considerations, combined with the graceful movements which it establishes, and the elegant means of self-defense which it furnishes, certainly render the art an object of considerable importance. Sparring equally produces the above beneficial effects in every point of view. End of Boxiana or Sketches of Ancient and Modern Pugilism by Pierce Egan Read by Rick Rodstrom